Welcome to the Great Big Book Club, Anna Wilson. Thank you very much for having me. It's great. <laughs> we met because we both write narrative nonfiction, which is a curious genre that not many people understand. And um, we were saying, weren't we, that there's a difference between narrative nonfiction and autobiography and, and memoir. And I'm wondering how they, how they categorised uh, your writing. Yeah, I think narrative nonfiction and memoir, actually, because my book's about my mother's autism. Um, so there's a lot of information about autism, which would uh, classify it as nonfiction. But because it's about my childhood and my relationship with my mother and my family, I guess that's where the narrative is. And in fact, some people have said it reads like a novel, which is lovely because I wanted the whole point of writing it really was to find the narrative in my family to try and make sense of this woman who was diagnosed with autism age 72 and to look back and think, well, when did it all start? You know, was it something she was born with? At the time, I had no idea. I didn't know very much about autism. So I think there's a narrative there and there's non-fiction elements and it's a memoir because it's about my life and my mother's life. What I found so moving about your book, Imogen, oh, sorry, Anna, God, what is the matter with me this morning? What I found so moving about your book, Anna, is the fact that it, uh, it's, it's, it has so much to say about understanding and compassion and forgiveness of a relative, um, and a relative that was very difficult. And it struck me that there were, there's a whole generation of, of women out there that would have had parents, either a man, either a father or a mother, that would have been autistic and we wouldn't have known we wouldn't have had words for that and they would have just seemed difficult or impossible or to, to those children and even to those adults so i found it very moving in that way and thought what how much easier it would have been for people of the last generation to have had compassion for their relatives had they had a real diagnosis and understand the difference in how the brain works i think that's absolutely right yes and um a lot of people have got in touch with me since reading the book to say exactly that and to say, oh my goodness, I think this is my mum or this is my dad or, you know, someone else in the family. And um, it's opened up conversations exactly like that. Of, okay, oh, they weren't just angry and difficult. And mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of autism presents itself in sometimes quite aggressive behaviour because the person with autism is dealing with so much anxiety and so much sort of overload in their life. They, they, they get sensory overload. They find it very difficult to cope with lots of noise, lots of excitement. So if you're a parent bringing up young children and you've got chaos all around you, mess and noise and disruption and, and unpredictable mm -hmm. behavior, if you're autistic, your, your reaction may well be to explode because you can't really cope with it. And as a child, you just think, well, my, my parent is very angry. So mm -hmm. to be able to understand, no, actually, we need to have time out sessions or whatever it is. We need coping mechanisms mm. so that we don't get to that point. Yeah, absolutely. But I think I, I think I wrote the book to try and understand that myself. And actually, initially, I didn't think I was writing about autism. I just thought I was writing about my mum. <laughs> so I guess that's where the narrative comes in, because I was just trying to piece together our family story. I remember I did a workshop once because in some of my, in one of my earlier books, The Battersea Park Road to Enlightenment, I did lots of those workshops that are out there that claim to be able to help you become a better, more enlightened person. And they put you through these processes. And there was a process, that's my cat complaining that it's raining outside and he's got wet, that they put you through a process, they put us through a process that was, that was to do with our childhood. And there was this woman that, has, that was reliving something that happened in her childhood. And I remember that she'd been shut in a cupboard as a child. And she was shouting, mommy, mommy, let me out, let me out. And it was so, and everyone who was a parent there, our hearts were like, let me out, let me out. But basically it was, a, it was an exercise about forgiveness. And we were saying that, Maybe she shut the child in the cupboard just so she wouldn't hit her as a means of, as a means of coping with the situation. But of course, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but in, in that day, in those days, she would have just been judged as cruel. And so I thought, what extraordinary hope f f for adults of 
that, that have grown up that had that had parents like that that they really couldn't understand and perhaps still haven't forgiven in any way because in workshops you meet people of 40 50 60 that still haven't forgiven their parents and you're giving them a way to do that by going let's look at this a different way i was like this book's really extraordinary and it's to be able to offer forgiveness to people through your writing is uh, an extraordinary gift oh thank you that's really means a lot to me because uh yes i've i've struggled with that all all my life really and i i used to say to my grandmother you know i just can't stand the way mum's behaving you know as an adult i would ring her mm, 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 mm. done that my poor grandmother who was always this rock in the background sort of looking after us all and she would just sort of sigh deeply and say you have to forgive her she's always been like this and that was sort of always in the back of my mind was yes I do you know I can't just I can't walk away from this however many times I wanted to you know there were times when I used to say I wish I could divorce my mother because you know our relationship was so difficult especially when I was an adult and I was trying to live my own life um, but I did love her, you know, at the, at the bottom. Of course, of course. I absolutely did love her. And, well, you say of course, but I think some people say, can, can actually put her hand on their heart and say they don't love their parents anymore because of the way they've been treated. But somehow, you know, there were moments, there were always moments of light with mum. You know, she wasn't consistently difficult. So she could be extremely loving and tactile, which is actually one of the reasons why people didn't believe she was autistic, because they'd say, oh, well, autistic people don't like hugs. But actually, if it was on mum's terms, she loved, you know, to be touched and hugged and all the rest of it. And she could be extremely loving. So you'd have these moments. In fact, I think there's, um, there's something called the rage cycle in autism where um, the sensory overload or whatever it is gets so much that the anger hits a person with autism quicker than perhaps you or I, you know, neurotypical people. Perhaps we can, some, we can normally feel anger building and perhaps try to be more rational about how we behave with it. Whereas an autistic person will have it hit them suddenly. And then there's this terrible remorse that quite often comes suddenly afterwards where they want extreme forgiveness. And, and that's exactly what mum was like. She'd have these full on rages. And then afterwards it was all hugs and I love you. And, you know, and during that time, that was when I was sort of battling with the forgiveness and, you know, really wanting to, yeah, just have compassion for her. But then there'd be another rage and you'd sort of have to go through the cycle yourself all over again. So, And you feel that as a reader of your book, you feel, how did she cope with this situation? And then there's another situation and then there's another situation. Um, and so it, it almost, for me anyway, it almost is like a manual for, for forgiveness. And then you've got to forgive the social services when you're trying to look after her as an older woman, aren't you? Because that is then impossible again. And when I, when I, first, uh, when I first rang Anna, I, I just, I rang her and said, how, how do you write this? How do you get through it? I mean, it's, it's so, it's such an emotional roller coaster even to read, how you can have sat down and, and, and written that. I, just extraordinary journey to have been on oh. well I suppose um, probably like you I mean uh, when you're writing I mean I didn't consciously set out to write this book anyway so I, I've always written morning pages which is this lovely discipline of sitting down every morning pouring your heart out in your journal and I did it instinctively from childhood not knowing what it was just keeping a diary mm. um, and actually, after my father died, I had some therapy and the therapist said, you just worked out how to deal with everything. As a child, you just instinctively reached for your notebook, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I said, I, I think I got to age 14 when I realized that the best way to deal with anger and disappointment was to reach for a pen and paper, write it all down, and then I could move on. So that's what I was doing the whole time when things were getting very difficult with mum's mental health. I would just turn to my diary. And I filled so many notebooks in that time. It's unbelievable. Normally it takes me at least a year to fill a big chunky paper chase notebook. But I think I got through three in the worst year of the time with mum and dad. So that was the basis for the book then. Because I had, I had literally transcribed conversations that we had had with her, with the doctors. And you must... Oh, that's how you did it. You lifted it from your diaries. That's interesting, actually, because, you know, I, I'm also, I was also a diary writer as a child. And pe people say to you, don't they, how did you become a writer? And I think, well, I've been a writer since, since I could write. 
And there's a saying, I don't know if you know this saying, that if you keep a diary one day, your diary will keep you. Did you have you ever heard that? Oh, that's I love so, that. yeah, so I was also a diary writer. So it was a fairly natural um, shift to me to, to shift from, from writing a diary to, to writing about what I do. Uh, some important differences, obviously, but... I'm interested that's how you did it, because I wondered how on earth does she remember all this? How does she have these, these notations, obviously, from previous years? Wonderful. Yeah, well, it's funny, because I found the same when I was reading your book, because there are so many lovely conversations in it. And to start with, I thought, gosh, how has she remembered having these conversations? And then I thought, well, she must have done what I did. She must have kept a diary, but actually, I never spoke to you about that. So we've obviously got that in common. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's helpful, though, isn't it? Especially if you've had a difficult a confrontation or something it's very helpful to then go back and write it down it helps you navigate it i think i i write a lot of conversation in my book because i because it keeps the it keeps things alive but i don't make anything up so my the simple solution to how do i is it's all recorded i record it and transcribe it and then i send it to the person i've had the conversation with in case there's anything that they feel they misrepresented themselves or they weren't or they're not happy with and I, I make sure I've got the okay obviously from the from the speaker um, but I like to break up my writing with a with an actual conversation um, yeah. no I felt the same and, and actually interestingly I didn't record anything but I did send it the mo most of the conversation is either between me and my sister me and my uncle or the you know the services involved or obviously my mum my dad my mum my dad have both passed away now but I did send all the, the whole thing to my uncle and my sister and I said if there's anything here that's incorrect or you feel yes. misrepresented let me know and there was only one thing my sister pulled me up on which was that I'd recorded something about us drinking a certain bottle of wine and she said she got the wrong wine <laughs> that was the only thing she was worried about <laughs> that's hysterical that's hysterical <laughs> fact that I'd you know written these very heart-rending conversations about grief and death and all these things she just cared about the wine <laughs> yes it's interesting I was thinking about that there are really some some well our, our books are very different in that your your book is 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 much deeper it goes to a much deeper place my book almost consciously doesn't go there because obviously in the joyful environmentalist i'm writing about i'm writing about the climate crisis but i'm just focusing on what we can do i think we've got in common in the books that we've written is that it's our experience of those stories if you like so you haven't written a manual for saving the planet that is impersonal you know you haven't just given people a list of things to do You've said, no. I went out and I did this and I met this person and I had this connection. The, the chapter on trees, for example, I absolutely love because you even have this personal connection with the trees, which is just, I and mean, I totally get that because I live in Cornwall surrounded by gnarly trees that I actually go and talk to every morning. <laughs> so I love that. You know, that was your personal experience. And I think that was, that's what's sort of similar between the two books is I'm not giving a manual for how to find out whether your relative is autistic. Yeah. I mean, there are headings above each chapter that are taken from other books on autism. And like you, I have an appendix in the back so that people can do further reading if they want to. So I'm hopefully tying it all into a broader picture so that if people are trying to, I don't know, confirm any suspicions that they may have about themselves or, or other relatives. I do have a passion for spreading the word about diagnosis mm -hmm. of autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But equally, it was our own experience. That's what drives the narrative. So because I think a lot of people that we have dismissed as impossible, difficult, selfish, narcissistic, all these judgments that society loves to dismiss people with. Um, the French have a saying, to understand all is to forgive all. And I think if we can, ha if we can approach people with more understanding and more compassion d deeply more understanding then we'll be more able to forgive and yeah. let's face it we need a bit more harmony and connection in the world don't we yeah yeah well I would say your book has things in common with that because I think for me reading it I felt a connection a wider connection with everyone else in terms of what I can do to make everybody's life more joyful, more <laughs> enhance everybody's life, you know. So I can say to my kids, you know, 
let's all just buy fountain pens. Let's all write with fountain pens. That's a lovely thing to do. And then our handwriting will look more beautiful. And it might encourage us to write more letters and, and not just get on the computer all the time or, you know, or buy some horrible scratchy plastic pen that's worth nothing and it just ends up in a landfill. Little things like that. And then things like going to the local, we've got a lovely local greengrocer with local mm. produce. And you can actually pick it up and smell it and choose the bits that you want and it's all beautifully laid out and it's you chat to the people in the shop and the whole experience is so much more lovely than going to a horrible impersonal supermarket where everyone looks grumpy and everything's wrapped in plastic. And I should just maybe explain to people listening that, that what I try to do in the Joyful Environmentalist is to is to look at all the things that we can do to help the planet that also enhance our own lives whether they're large or small. That's the joyful environmentalist, because there's a lot of, in the environmental movement, there's a lot of uh, depression. There's, there's a lot of overwhelm. People thinking, oh, it's so big, there's just nothing I can do, nothing I can do. So I thought I'd fill a whole book of things that we can do, both huge and small. And the, the fountain pen that, that Anna refers to is I'm saying, you know, why do we have homes now with 32 plastic biros in? You know, our parents had one beautiful fountain pen. And, and so that's an example of, it, of enhancing our life by having one beautiful thing that we cherish rather than 32 pieces of rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's one of the tiny things. Yeah, but that, that yes. people's lives to think, well, actually, I could do something that's good, but it also makes me feel good. And um, yeah, I mean, as a family, we're really into that, especially things like two minute beach cleans. That's our favorite thing. So we'll just yes. take a bag in our pocket, go for a lovely walk, and then don't get depressed if you find litter, just pick it up and then recycle it when you go home. And then you've done something good and you've had a lovely walk. So I would say, yeah, the book's full of ideas for things like that, that really make your life more fun. So Anna, I know you write children's books as well, but um, what after A Place for Everything, um, are you planning on doing more adult books? Where would you go from here? Yeah, oh well, my, so actually behind me, rather strategically placed, are a couple of my children's books. So if I move my head, you might be able to see that book there. In fact, I'll get it down. It's an almanac, um, a nature <gasps> almanac. So you might actually, I'll have to send you a copy as well. It's Nature Month by Month, published by Nosy Crow with the National Trust. And every month oh. there are things you can do that enhance your life by getting out into nature. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. <laughs> my inner 10 year old, my inner girl guide wants to go and yeah, it, it do is. all those it's, things. It's, it's the girl guide handbook meets, yeah, the joyful environmentalist. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> that. And then also this picture book, which is also National Trust, The Wide Wide Sea, which is really about two minutes peak. Oh. But it's also about connecting with a sea creature and understanding that they live in the same world as us and we have responsibilities towards each other and all that sort of thing. So they're coming out. So they, they're in my children's books, but I am writing an adult book, but I don't know whether it's fiction or non-fiction because it's based on the house that I now live in in Cornwall and all the people that have come in and out of this house. And I'm starting to think it probably should be non-fiction. But, but as always, I can't find the narrative thread at the moment. So that's my big project. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful, Anna. And what sort of reception have you had for from uh, a place for everything? Have you how's how's it been received? I know you were on Woman's Hour, which for any author is a is a big accomplishment to get that little gig. Um, how how was the response from that? Yeah, that it's been overwhelming actually. I particularly from people I know. I mean, I have had <laughs> contact from people I don't know as well, but. Um, People I know, who are, and I knew nothing about their own family backgrounds. Uh, so people I went to school with, and they've emailed me, or they've phoned me, or they've Facebook messaged me saying, oh my goodness, there's someone in my family who's like this, and you know, you've really put things into context. Or, or even just talking about grief, a lot of people my age are obviously losing parents, sadly, at the moment, or you know, their parents are ailing. And so they've got in contact to say that they've very much appreciated that I've been able to articulate grief and dealing with death and that sort of thing. So, yeah, so it's been quite overwhelming because I've, I've responded to everybody individually. And every time I do, I feel a great surge of, well, the grief comes back every time. But 
Yeah, but it's, it's good because you're touching such deep things. I mean, when I get a letter from someone, it's something like, you know, I've changed to uh, an energy efficient energy supplier, a sustainable energy supplier, or I'm now with an ethical bank. I read your book, An Ethical Bank. Or the other day, I thought I've not lived in vain because someone wrote to me and went, I've been out and I bought my very first compost bin. I'm like, yes, yes, Isabel, someone's bought a compost bin. They're making earth, real earth, the stuff on which life <laughs> depends. And, and I just, you know i can dance around the room if i think someone's bought a compost bin because of my book but that's it you know it's just i have a new this or that or you are transforming the way i'm living fair enough but they don't write to me long emotional letters like the ones you must have so yes i can imagine emotional letters every single time someone writes to you yeah well, it's that's but that's the joy of being a writer isn't it when that when the readers respond well, Anna, it's been absolutely lovely talking to you. I could talk to you all day about about this, about these uh, subjects and about writing. And oh, well, it's lovely. It's lovely to speak with you. And thank you very much for giving us some time this morning and for coming along and, and bringing a place for everything to the Great Big Book Club. Thank you. Thank you very much for chatting with me. I hope one day we'll meet in real life, go for a long walk and continue chatting. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.